How much leeway should newspapers have when reporting on public figures, even if their reporting contains errors? To find out, you have to read the landmark case of New York Times versus Sullivan, but it's 24 pages long. Don't have time for that? I've got you covered. This is TLDR, where normally I cover New York Court of Appeals cases in five minutes or less. But this is part of a special series on landmark cases. This is the episode on New York Times versus Sullivan, which is a cornerstone in understanding the balance between freedom of the press and protecting individual reputations. This is another thrilling installment of our series on landmark Supreme Court cases. Get ready to explore the intricacies of this pivotal decision. The citation for this case is 376 U.S. 254, and it was published by the United States Supreme Court on March 9th, 1964. This is a case so important, it's practically got its own gravitational pull in the legal world. Its implications are far-reaching and continue to be felt in modern legal contexts. Buckle up, because we're diving into a case that shaped the very foundation of freedom of the press in America and still still influences journalism today. This case revolved around the concept of libel. It was a defining moment in the ongoing struggle between free speech and defamation. To understand this case, the background that's helpful to know is the First Amendment. This crucial part of the Bill of Rights is the cornerstone of American democracy and the spirit of journalism. The text of the First Amendment states, in relevant part, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Cases have held that the First Amendment protects the right to speak your mind without the government throwing you in jail for a strongly worded letter or sign. It's what allows you to voice your opinions, whether they're popular or controversial, without fear of government retribution. But you should also understand that each state has laws against defamation, which is when one party makes a damaging false statement about another party. When a false and damaging statement is in written form, that's called libel. This can lead to serious legal consequences including lawsuits and financial penalties. A civil lawsuit can be filed seeking money damages from a party that either commits a defamatory statement or writes a libelous statement. This raises the question in this case, where do you draw the line between protected speech and libel? Especially when it comes to criticizing public officials this is a delicate balance that courts often have to navigate, ensuring that free speech is upheld while protecting individuals from harmful falsehoods. So, what are facts of this case? In the 1960s, the United States was undergoing a powerful civil rights movement, and of the leaders of the civil rights movement was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King lived in Alabama, and much of the action in the civil rights movement took place in Alabama, including the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott with Rosa Parks, 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, and the 1965 Bloody Sunday beatings at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. Alabama was a battleground in the war over civil rights. In response to civil rights activities in Alabama, the defendants here took out a full-page advertisement in the New York Times on March 29, 1960, entitled, Heed Their Rising Voices. In that advertisement, the defendants wrote that certain officials were engaged in a wave of terror against students engaged in nonviolent demonstrations. Specifically, the advertisement stated that after students sang, My Country, Tis of Thee, student leaders were expelled from school and truckloads of armed police ringed the college. It further alleged that the entire student body protested by refusing to register for college in the Rykov. 
and their dining room was padlocked to starve them into submission. Several of these allegations were untrue or misleading. The advertisement was meant to raise funds for the defense of Martin Luther King Jr. against perjury charges in Alabama. This ad was a call to action, urging people to support the civil rights movement and highlighting the injustices faced by African Americans. While the ad didn't specifically name Sullivan, he argued that because it concerned the police department he oversaw, it defamed him indirectly. Sullivan, who was the public safety commissioner, felt that his reputation was tarnished by the implications made in the ad. Commissioner Sullivan sued the New York Times for libel, claiming that they published falsehoods that damaged him. The New York Times, understandably, cried foul. They believed that the lawsuit was an attempt to silence the press and stifle the important work of reporting on civil rights abuses. They argued that the ad was protected free speech and appealed the decision. The case would eventually make its way to the Supreme Court, setting the stage for a landmark ruling on the First Amendment and the protection of free speech in the context of public criticism. But the Alabama law did not provide for a free speech exception to defamation or a privilege based upon the fact that the issue was of public concern and related to a public official. The jury in Alabama found the New York Times liable and awarded Sullivan a hefty sum of $500,000 in damages. This was the largest libel award ever in the country and it threatened to have a chilling effect on the press. The decision was seen as a significant blow to the freedom of the press and raised concerns about the ability to criticize public officials without fear of retribution. The Alabama courts uh, upheld the hefty damages awarded to Sullivan, but the New York Times took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. They argued that the Alabama court's decisions were stifling free speech and went against the First Amendment. The Supreme Court, in a landmark decision, agreed to hear the case. In a unanimous decision, all nine justices on the Supreme Court sided with the New York Times. The court ruled that the First Amendment's protection of free speech, especially when it comes to matters of public concern, outweighed the need to protect individual reputations. They create a new standard for libel cases involving public officials. To win a libel case, a public official would now have to prove actual malice meaning prove that the publisher knew the statement was false or acted with reckless disregard for the truth. The impact of the New York Times versus Sullivan case on future issues cannot be overstated. This landmark decision has set a precedent for protecting freedom of speech and the press in the United States. It has provided a robust defense for journalists and media organizations against defamation lawsuits ensuring that they can report on matters of public interest without fear of retribution. The case has also influenced subsequent rulings on free speech and continues to be a cornerstone in the ongoing battle for civil liberties and the protection of the First Amendment. The Sullivan ruling has emboldened investigative journalism, enabling reporters to uncover corruption, hold the powerful accountable, and shine a light on social injustices. From the Pentagon Papers to Watergate, the legacy of this case is evident in the courageous work of journalists who dare to speak truth to power. But the ripple effect doesn't end there. The decision has also inspired global movements for press freedom, influencing judicial systems around the world to adopt similar standards. As we navigate the complexities of information in the digital age, the principles established by New York Times, Sullivan remain as relevant as ever, reminding us of the essential role that a free press plays in a democratic society. And so, the echoes of this historic ruling continue to reverberate, safeguarding the rights of those who seek to inform, challenge, and inspire us all. If you like what you just saw and want to see more just like it, please hit like or subscribe to let me know.